Hello everyone, Alex here from 20 Sides to Every Story, and today I'm excited to continue our conversations about Dolmen Wind. In this video, I'll be covering some of the latest updates from Gavin Norman on how character creation works in Dolmen Wood using its own mechanics versus a strictly old school essentials character creation process. As discussed in my previous video, Necrotic Gnome has announced that Dolmen Wood will expand in scope from being simply a setting to being its own game system. This new system aims to introduce players, particularly new players, to the old school tradition of TTRPGs, while still being compatible with old school renaissance systems like old school essentials. For those who may not be familiar with Dolmenwood, it is a campaign setting being developed by Gavin Norman that draws heavily from fairy tales, weird fantasy, and old English folklore. It was previously being developed as a campaign setting for Old School Essentials, but is now being retooled to include some rules, some mechanics, that allow it to be played independently. So, what do these changes look like for class, kindred, level advancement, etc. In this video, I'll break down some of these elements and point out some of the key differences uh, that'll make character creation unique under the new system. Please keep in mind that everything I talk about here today is accurate of as of today, which is April 27th. So there, there could be some further tweaking and changes uh, before the anticipated campaign uh, Kickstarter, which is expected to launch sometime later this summer. So. Let's begin by taking a look at the general process of character creation. Character creation begins as it did with Old School Essentials with the core six ability scores of strength, intelligence, wisdom, dexterity, constitution, and charisma. This all remains unchanged. 3d6 rolls down the line. As you can see, next we would choose a kindred, kindred and a class. Kindred is new terminology that Dolman would is adopting to replace the antiquated terminology of race. So this is a departure from the default mode of old school essentials where the race as class tradition was presented as the default. So big change here for Dolman would. This choice of kindred and class is being separated out and will be the standard procedure. And I am guessing if we go and we take a look here at the table of contents, we have appendices here for, for, for multi-classing and for kindred as class options. So that will still be a piece of it. As for kindred options, players will be allowed to choose from human, bregel, which is the new term adopted for the goat folk, who's formerly the goat folk, elf, the grimalkin, the mossling, formerly the moss dwarf, and uh, the wood grew. Let's start by taking a look at the kindred option of human, which is presented as the suggested choice for new players. I kind of like that design choice myself because I personally, for my game, forced my players to choose human initially. I think that kind of allows the discovery of the other unique kindreds to the system to be maybe explored. My my rule for my game is that if uh, a character dies, a player can uh, create a new character using any kindred that had been discovered in the cycle of play. So subsequent characters can be, it sort of encourages some of that, that, that exploration and adds to that sense of wonder for players that are just entering into this, this new campaign setting that they don't know anything about. So let me just uh, back up a step and kind of talk about the format of how kindreds are presented in the player's guide now. We get a few additional details that we didn't have before in previous iterations of the player's guide. So as you can see here on the screen, we get we have some dice rolls to make at character creation uh, to determine a first level character's age, their normal lifespan, height, weight, all of those things if we... You know, sometimes when you're creating a character, you you just want to whip through and and have some of those things automatically generated for you rather than spending a lot of time kind of thinking or hemming and hawing about <laughs> details like, like how old they are and such. You also get their kindred type, as you can see the, at the top there. All of the kindreds are classified as either mortal, fairy, or demi-fey, which has some implications for some of the features that we will see throughout. You also get a entry here about 
kindred relations. Just some general flavor about how maybe, for example, how do how do elves view mortals or how do elves view, you know, Grimmelkin or something like that. Um, so you get a little entry on there. We also have a chart here for, at least for humans, we've got a random name generator, which is extremely helpful for creating a character on the fly. Another thing that you will see on here is that we also get what their native languages are. So human gets Woldish, which is basically the common language that is generally shared amongst the characters and townsfolk and a lot of the, at least the civilized places in Dolmenwood that you will travel. Um, this is in addition to your alignment language. They still have alignment languages in this, um, which... Uh, I guess if anyone has ever used the, an alignment language in their game, like leave a comment uh, on the video. I'd lo love to hear that. Um, I've never heard of anyone using it in a meaningful way in their games, and I've always been kind of curious about that. So, so m many of the kindreds will have an entry here about um, what kind what kind of classes do are typical for this kindred. Of course, human adventurers were looking at the human entry. Kind of all classes, right? Like they're they're always been kind of presented that way that they are very uh I don't know, ambidextrous when it comes to classes. There are maybe a couple like like it names here the enchanter is a little bit of a derivative of some of the um uh, the fairy when we had races class, you know, elves, grimalkins and um and such they they had glamours and they had fairy runes and things like that. Those have been kind of pulled out from the kindred and made into its own class called the uh enchanter. And so that one's maybe a little bit of a stretch for the human, but for the most part humans can kind of become wh whatever. And then we've got some uh sort of unique traits I'm not seeing it here anymore. Uh, previously, the humans had a plus one bonus to an adventuring skill of their choice. There's a big emphasis in Dolmenwood on kind of streamlining the skill process. Anytime you have to roll D6 for listening or foraging or whatnot, those are starting to... One of the neat things about this rewrite of these Dolmenwood procedures and everything is kind of giving things game terminology that's a little bit easier for... Uh, new players to reference and such. I think in a previous version of this, I also saw that the human got a plus one to two ability scores of their choice. It would appear that that is gone as well. I don't see that anymore. So they still retain this blessed trait. Blessed trait allows them to roll their hit points, their hit die twice and take the better result. So essentially giving our uh, like kind of an advantage mechanic to uh, when you have to roll hit points. And I... <laughs> I have some players that would very much have liked that trait. When you're rolling a one on your level one character, oof, that's rough. They also have this decisiveness trait, which says when an initiative roll is tied, humans get to act first as if they had one initiative. So that's that's very useful trait to have. Um, they also have the leadership trait, which provides a bonus to morale when dealing with retainers and hirelings. They get spirited. I think this is a new one. I don't remember this being in here. Humans are quick to learn and adapt. Get a t plus 10% bonus to experience points earned. So that might be a good carrot for getting the new new players to maybe consider running as a human for their first, uh, first romp in an old school system. And then the entry ends with some really cool random tables. We've got one for uh, backgrounds, a D100 chart that details previous occupations, things that your character maybe were doing before they took up the mantle of being an adventurer. We've got a D100 table of trinkets. I always like trinket tables for character creation because they sometimes seed a little something to flavor the character, or give them a backstory, or tell us a little something about where they where they came from. It's nice to have that as kind of a, a starting point or a seed to telling a, a story about who, who your character is. And then we get a bunch of tables for things like appearance, demeanor, some of those more details that kind of make up who is the personality of this person, their beliefs, their desires. If you need to create a character, a fully fleshed out character on the fly, you've got the tools here to do that. Let's uh, let's move on here. Let's talk about some of the others, starting with the, the Bregel. 
formerly the Goat Folk. Same kinds of information here. We've got their kindred type. You can make some rolls for some of those some of those details. You get some flavor about the difference between the short horns and the long horns and how that's a kind of a social class difference. The long horns being the nobility and the short horns being uh kind of the the grunts and such and a little bit of detail about nag lord uh the nag lord's uh minions the crook horns if you wanted to create the, the, there's precedent in the system for half breggles those that share ancestry with both humans and and uh i keep wanting to say goat folk but breggles you got some some clarity on how to create such a character favored class is a knight Although Bre Bregalo adventurers are also commonly fighters or magicians, only occasionally accepted into the ranks of the church as clerics or friars. So the the Bregal um, has this ability called Gaze, which is something that they acquire at level four because apparently level advancement is tied to like I guess your your horns grow as you advance in levels, and so. Once they become a long whore at level four, they will gain this ability, which is basically a it forces a save versus spell on the target, who then has to make make that check or become charmed by the longhorn character. Fairly a uh, useful ability that can be used w once per day at level four, and then you get additional uses, I believe. Yes, as you go up in level, and then you even get how long are your horns at various levels? So seems to be basically equated with your at level one, you got one inch horns little little nubby nubs and then they continue to grow as a level advance so that's kind of a fun fun idea again we've got backgrounds we've got trinkets for the breggles maybe less backgrounds than the human but still a d100 uh chart for the the trinkets and as you can see some of these details are still being written and developed so of course the same things you get some things about desires beliefs and appearance that kind of allow for some variation next up we've got the elf kindred uh which favors the sorcerer class or at least i think it was formerly formerly the sorcerer class i think now they're calling it the enchanter but elf adventurers are also commonly fighters or hunters as godless folk they're unable to become clerics or friars elves have a bonuses to listen and search they used to have a bonus to stealth but i think that probably for balancing reasons has been taken out they still have access to one randomly chosen glamour that's kind of fun if if you've been listening to our or watching our dolmenwood playthrough the glamours are kind of like those those special tool set things that the the elves have access to from fairy and uh Silver upon his brow has one that I think it's called Change Face that allows them to like kind of change their appearance, not really doppelganger, but just kind of change facial features and such. They have Magic Resistance, which is a plus two bonus to saving throws against magic. They still have the vulnerability to cold iron. Not a ton of changes on that one. You got backgrounds, you got trinkets, all the same things for the kindreds there. Uh, moving on, we're looking at the uh, Grimmelkin, which favors the thief class but the only thing is they, they've got some restrictions they can't be friars they can't be clerics and typically they are not knights so of course gribblekins are the shape-changing cat-like fairy creatures they've got three different forms that they can turn into they can they're they're typical i guess i think of it as the the default mode is the kind of anthropomorphic cat like character uh kind of short small in stature they could turn into their their moggy form, which is like their house cat form, or their predatory form, the wilder, which is sort of the I don't know the Cheshire cat kind of predatory eyes in the darkness, kind of looking out at you. Grimmelkins favor the thief class. Sometimes they are enchanters, hunters, or minstrels. They're not able to become clerics or friars, just like the elves and not accepted into the ranks of Dolmenwood nobility, so they cannot become knights. They also get, as fairy, a single randomly determined glamour. I love this ability, the eating giant rodents. After spending one turn eating a freshly killed giant rodent, a Grimmelkin hit, uh, heals one hit point. Uh, they get a little defensive bonus because of their uh, small stature, plus two AC bonus. A little bonus to listening skills. They also have magic resistance shape-shifting abilities here there's some rules and mechanics that kind of govern when they're tr transformed 
transformed into their uh, Chester form, the cat form. They got some stats there. They have some attacks. They can make a bite and two claw attacks each round. They can change back by spending a round, only possible when the Grimmelkin is unobserved by any other sentient being. And then they have the, you know, the wilder form. They can do that once per day. And upon enter entering wilder, they can heal up 2d6 hit points, which is pretty, pretty powerful. And they are near invisible when they are in the wilder form, and they gain... Armor class of 13, speed of 30, and can make a bite and two claw attacks each round, and that lasts for 2d4 rounds. I could see how the Grimmelkin is going to be a popular option. <laughs> they're, they're, they're pretty powerful. Backgrounds, trinkets, and all the rest. Mossling. Mossling. Formerly known as the Moss Dwarf. The Mosslings are the short in stature dwarf sort of appear at least in appearance they've got typically like big beards of leaves or moss or lichen and or sometimes fungus growing in their beards they oftentimes have kind of like okra or orange or moldy colored maybe flesh they usually lurk deep in the forest in little communities farming and gathering uh doing a lot of foraging sometimes they're in human settlements Selling mushrooms, ale, or cheese at market. The classes they prefer, Hunter is the obvious choice for a Mossling, although they are also commonly accepted fighters, only occasionally accepted into the ranks of the church as clerics or friars. Rarely have aptitude for magic. But if you look here at armor and weapons, armor must be tailored to Mossling size small size likewise mosslings cannot wield large weapons i don't remember that terminology showing up anywhere in old school essentials so it seems to be new terminology that will be listed on equipment lists in the dolman wood game system uh mossling have still have their knacks those quasi magical crafts those were taken out the last time i looked at this but now they're back in um i think that's probably the right call the knacks are they're like little talents that the mossling has like let's just take a look at like yeast master is the one i remember so you can ferment the mossling can cause sweet liquids to ferment by touch at a rate of one pint per turn so they can be kind of your your personal brew master in the group and of course it, it scales all the way up to level seven they can summon omnipresent microorganisms the mossling is able to conjure a yeasty feast equivalent to 1d6 standard rations the food is composed of chunks of fleshy compacted yeast frothing sheets of slime and bubbles of alcoholic brew such a feast may only be produced once per day next up we have the wood grew our bat-faced demi fey who are favored to become minstrels and have the same restrictions as grimmelkin regarding playing as friars clerics or knights they retain their compulsive jubilation trait which forces them to make a save versus spell check if they are near a festival or party to avoid getting sucked into socializing the wood grew loved party we just had some wood grew show up in our last dolman wood playthrough it looks like they also retain their dark vision uh okay they get a plus two armor class bonus because of small size that's consistent with Gr grimmelkin and they also retain the mad revelry ability which allows them to produce magical effects from compulsive dancing drinking and laughter it's worth noting that none of the kindreds have like differentiated level caps you know it used to be in old school essentials you're human they, they could advance for forever but the other kindreds are the your elf your dwarf and such they all had a like an endpoint to advancement now everything everything comes with a level 15 cap that's the standard cap for level advancement i don't know about you but i don't i don't typically have my campaigns uh ever get to that point or close to that point but you know i guess it could happen all right, so I think we're going to move on and look at classes under the new proposed system. There has been some changes here. Uh, we have Dolmenwood specific classes. Um, the Friar, the Hunter, the Knight, and the Minstrel are still present. And we also have some classes that serve as standards for those included in old school essentials. So we've got the Cleric, 
or at least a kind of modified version of the cleric. We've got the enchanter, the fighter, magician, and thief. So let's look at some of these changes. Let's look at cleric first. One major change that I see right here at the beginning is if you look at armor, any, including shields and weapons, any. In old school essentials, it does make a clarification. It's any blunt weapon. So I guess you're no longer limited to just <laughs> bashing uh, in the tradition of St. Cuthbert them over the head with a cudgel or a mace. You can use whatever. I think there's a little bit of an effort here maybe to make the cleric kind of fit a little like you could make a paladin essentially like a cleric could be kind of a paladin if if you wanted to flavor him that way i don't know if that's the intention exactly but i think there's some effort to make the cleric very distinct from friar or further distinct from the friar maybe that's one of those one of those things another change that we see here is that they have an alignment uh restriction restriction of lawful or neutral a cleric who becomes chaotic falls from grace and would lose their spellcasting abilities until a quest for atonement is completed. Uh, another additional thing here for the cleric is they have an ability called Detect Holy Magic Items. They can identify holy magic items simply through touch, taking a turn to do so. Spellcasting for the cleric begins at level two they get their first spell so that's consistent with the ose convention one thing that's kind of cool here um you choose a holy order i know typically in osr type games we don't have a lot of player choices in terms of character creation or character advancement but i'm, I'm kind of i'm a fan of this this one because it is rooted in the flavor of Dolmenwood. So level two, Cleric chooses their holy order from the Order of St. Fraxis, the Order of St. Sedge, or the Order of St. Cygnus. So if you choose the Order of St. Fraxis, you're going to be getting a plus two bonus to saving throws against magic and allows the Cleric to be sort of a witch hunter type. Um, you can also choose the Order of St. Sedge, which provides a Lay on Hands ability that allows the Cleric to heal a total of one hit point per level per day, or the Order of St. Cygnus, which allows the Cleric to bypass the requirement of using magical or silver weapons on resilient undead foes. It grants a plus one bonus to attacks against undead foes undead monsters so that's a that's a pretty cool pretty handy uh trait to have we see you know of course clerics have to have turn undead and they they retain that here for the dolmenwood cleric a little bit of a streamlined process i would say compared to old school essentials the turn range is clarified as being within 30 feet of the cleric undead that are concealed are not affected there's a there's a chart down here so it is still a 2d6 roll to determine the number of to determine the result of the turn undead on the left hand side of the table you have the differential you're comparing the cleric's level and the creature's level and that gives you what line you would refer to for your 2d6 roll there are three options or three um, outcomes to the turn the creatures can either be stunned they can be turned and flee or they can be outright destroyed if you got a mixed group of undead, you would start with the lowest level or the lowest power undead creatures. It's 2d4 is the number affected. So uh, I didn't mention this or it's not a huge maybe change really, but just a terminology thing here is that uh, spell casting is now the, the list for clerics is called the holy magic list. And so that's the list of spells that the cleric can prepare. And I'm a huge fan of this change. Cleric spells are now, it's not spell level, it's spell rank. I think it's good to have different terminology for different game uh, mechanics, right? So we got level advancement, then spell level. It's always been confusing to new players, not, not necessarily seasoned players, but that, that's, a, that's a, the right call, I think, to make. Let's move on to the Enchanter. This class uses fairy magic, has access to fairy runes and glamours, which were originally things that were tied up in the Kindred as class setup of before. The Enchanter is a standalone class. I think its its role really, you know, you can see um, within here that it, it talks a lot about it being very rare for mortals to possess these talents. 
And so I think this was really, really a way to kind of extract some of those abilities from the fairy races, the fairy kindreds, pull them apart and make them their its own class. Prime abilities are charisma and intelligence. The Chanter can wear light and medium armor and wield small and medium weapons. So it kind of puts them in that kind of hybrid class a bit between a, a fighter and a spellcaster. So the Enchanter gains an innate detect magic ability, as you can see here. It's a D6 skill, starts out as a 2D6 and uh, sorry, two in six chance to detect traces or auras around objects or identify that there's some kind of spell or magic afoot. And that is something that improves with level advancement. And you can see here, we've got a table that shows the uh, improvement in that skill over time. I think that's a great choice to have detect magic for some of these arcane quote-unquote, spellcasters. I don't know about other GMs out there. I typically like the read magic or detect magic type of spells. I typically gave my wizards for free or by default and let them choose one other uh, ability. So I, I like that call of it being a default. At level one, the enchanter possesses one randomly determined fairy rune and can acquire more through gameplay. There's sort of a process here, but most it's not... Uh, it's not a level advancement thing. It's you got a quest for it to fight. You got to go interact with other fey lords, enter fairy, and and pro provide some kind of service or go on a quest in order to maybe be gifted another additional rune. Additionally, the enchanter gains a number of magic abilities known as glamours at level one. So, like I mentioned before, silver upon his brow in our game, in the Dolmenwood game that we play, uses the change face glamour quite a bit. Enchanters can use certain magic items, typically restricted to just arcane casters, and they are resistant to divine aid, which is a real pain in the butt, right? Like, anytime your cleric is casting cure wounds on your elf, or, uh, sorry, your enchanter, there's a two in six chance that it will have no effect. The saints of the one true god are loath to aid those allied with the godless realm of fairy. All right, moving on to the fighter class. The Dolmenwood fighter gains combat talents. That's really the big change here. A bit of customization that you don't have with the old school essentials fighter. So at levels 2, 5, 8, 11, and 14, they can choose one of the following talents these unique abilities that allows for some variation, especially if you've got multiple fighters in the party. The available talents are Cleave, which allows striking multiple foes when dealing a killing blow. Defender imposes an attack roll penalty to strikes against other allies in melee. Leader gives a morale bonus and plus two to saving throws against fear effects to allies within 60 feet. Main Gosh, which... Enables two-weapon fighting and provides a plus one bonus to attack and armor class when fighting with a light weapon in the offhand. Slayer, which grants a plus one bonus to attack and damage rolls against foes of a particular type. And Weapon Specialist, which offers a plus one bonus to attack and damage rolls using a chosen, excuse me, using a chosen type of weapon. All right, take a look, quick look at Friar. Uh, not a lot. Honestly, that has changed here. There's a, some minor change to the XP progression in their saving throws, attack bonus, but really, they're, they're mostly they're mostly the same. Uh, I did notice that the Friar now has the same alignment restrictions as the Cleric, and they have that same Fallen Room Grace uh, feature. Uh, the Hunter has undergone several changes from the OSC version, I think primarily because with uh old schools or sorry with the new dolman wood system there is some intentionality about um kind of streamlining skill system you see here that the hunter skills their abilities are all it's all d6 chance right in terms of success for these different things so uh, they've got alertness which allows the hunter to act during a surprise round they have stalking which kind of takes the place of Kind of the, the thief's ability to hide in the shadows and sneak. Uh, the determining factor here is, are they outside or in um, in the wild? In, in, and they also have their tracking yet. 
I believe in the original Dolman Wood player's guide, it was all based on percentile, which I know in our game, like, always tripped us up. Like, we're switching between D6 and percentile for skill system. So I'm I'm kind of glad to see that this is starting to get kind of streamlined a little bit with just the, the D6 system and then pluses and minuses for penalties or bonuses. There's a handy little chart here that shows you kind of a natural progression of what the one in six chances for those different skills. But um, I, I'm i kind of falling in love a little bit with the customizing hunter skills optional rule that you see here in the sidebar. I think my players would appreciate this too, is you could kind of um, give them a little bit of a, a point by system to customize those skills. And so every time that they gain a level up, they would get an expertise point that they could use to increase that one in six chance to me, a two in six chance, for example, with the maximum chance of success in any of these skills being a five in six. As we'll see later, a lot of times the, uh, the role of a six is kind of like a crit fail or like the, the worst type of failure, the worst degree of failure you could have. Let's take a look at Knight. The Knight class has some added flavor encouraging players to think about who their liege is and who, what what house of the Dolmenwood that they serve. I think previously it really just kind of listed some names of some different houses, and now he has included here a little bit of detail. Uh, not a ton, but um, a, a line or two about the different houses. Other than this, though, the knight is mostly unchanged, except for they do have a little bit more favorable of an attack bonus than they had previously, starting with a plus one at level one. Moving on to the Magician class, essentially the same as in OSC uh, with the Wizard, but there is some added flavor. Right away, I noticed there we've got a difference here with these starting spell books. You roll a d6 at uh, character creation, and you get to see what types of spells are contained within spell book. It has a name that maybe is evocative of its origins, where it came from, Kind of a handy handy way to uh, streamline that process. The Magician also gains that Detect Magic skill, that default Detect Magic ability, which is, again, just a great call. I think many GMs give this, bo this, this type of magic away for free at level 1 anyway, just so the wizard doesn't have to burn their spell selection on something that isn't maybe as, as utility. Minstrel class has undergone a few changes that I noticed. Their anti-charm ability from before has now been renamed Counter Charm. Provides a plus two bonus to saving throws against fairy magic and song-based magical effects while within 30 feet of the minstrel when they play magic. The former ability was a little convoluted. Um, so this is this is a welcome change from for my viewpoint. And here we can see the minstrel skills have been, uh, just like with the hunter, have been put into the standardized, well, you know, D6 kind of system. Um, they gain the decipher documents skill, which seems to be a replacement for the former read languages feature. They have monster lore, a skill that improves over time instead of the two and six chance that they had previously. And the minstrel gains the listen and pick pockets skills similar to what the the thief has there's a sidebar here same kind of thing there's an optional point buy system for allocating those skill points uh, with level advancement now finally let's talk about the thief class in dolmenwood the dolmenwood thief provides great clarification on all aspects of this class which is a blessing for gms who have struggled with the ambiguity of the thief um from from times past. I know I always have, so I appreciate some of the clarity that comes with this. Starting with backstab, the rules for backstab are now very clearly defined. A successful stealth check can be used to gain a bonus to attack. The target must be a living humanoid no taller than nine feet. Humanoid, that's great. I, I, I always got people that wanted to backstab the big dragon, right? There's now some clear guidance on that. The damage is established at 3d4 on a successful strike. If you're using a magical weapon or such, you can still get the bonus. If it's a plus one dagger, you can get a plus one on the 3d4. Over here, you can see the thief skills are expanded in uh, clarity and mechanics. So climbing walls now requires 
uh, for climbs over 100 feet, you might need to make more than one uh, check. A separate roll is required for each stretch of 100 feet. And failure, But failure does not necessarily result in damage. I think that that's typically how I would have played it in the past, is if you failed, then there's some amount of damage, and we, we try to figure that out. How many feet did you fall? Blah, 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 blah. Now uh, it is clarified, only on a natural six must the thief make a save versus doom or fall from the halfway point, taking 1d6 damage per 10 feet of fall. Retrying is an option. Cost, you'll burn a, another 10 minutes, another subsequent turn, but uh, doable. So greater clarity there. Uh, deciphered documents allows for retries after level advancement. If you fail on your deciphered documents, check to, I don't know, decipher the, the, the weird tome that you pulled back from uh, your last adventure, you can you can reattempt it after level advancement. Disarming traps. Each attempt, you can attempt it as many times as you want, but on a roll of a natural six, the thief must save versus doom or spring the trap. The retries, retries outside of that are cost a turn to do. Uh, picking locks is now more forgiving than it had been. Uh, allows the thief to try as many times as they want each attempt taking a turn. Uh, pickpocketing imposes penalties based on the target's level in a natural six. The thief must roll versus doom or be noticed by the victim. So I'm, I'm a big fan of this. Like there's a crit fail option or there's a crit fail condition for rolling that d6. Even if you're, you've, you've skilled up to being a five and six chance, you still could potentially have that off day. The stealth skill now combines what it been in the OSC as the move silently and hide in shadows skill and it it adds that clarity that during a surprise round you you get a chance to make this roll to see if you remain undetected definitely can give some extra survivability to the thief and you know sets up a process for when do these rolls happen so uh, those are the changes to character creation in Dolmenwood Hope you enjoyed this video. I hope you're like me and you're looking forward to the Kickstarter launch. Sounds like sometime this summer, late summer, July, August. If you like this video, please consider liking and subscribing to our YouTube channel here. We also run a Dolmenwood campaign on Twitch. We also release it and put it out as a podcast. So if you're interested in any of those things, just check the video description. I'll put some links there so you can catch us live. We play those games every other Saturday and then kind of when I have time, I edit the podcast and put it up. So if you're interested in any of that, please uh, check it out. Thank you for watching and we'll see you next time.